Hey everybody, welcome to the basics of data-driven decision-making, module number one. So let's go through what we are going to cover in this module and um, we'll get started. So the study of statistics is vitally important, yet many people only have at most a vague understanding of it. Statistical analysis plays a role in everything from politics to social sciences to studies of biological diversity and, of course, to business. Individuals that have a deep understanding of this science are in high demand. Many people think they understand stats, but the actual results of a statistical analysis can be counterintuitive. That's why it's important to beyond move beyond intuition and into the realm of science. It's important to realize that statistics is not an end in itself. Rather, it's a means for identification and analysis of problems, and it's a useful tool to arrive at better decisions. The statistical method is used to make decisions with ramifications in the real world, and that makes the science a vital part of modern business. Simply put, statistics attempts to make sense of data. Descriptive statistics involves the collection of and description of data. Once the data has been collected and described, the researcher is then able to understand the context in which the results are presented. On the other hand, inferential statistics collects data from a subset of a population and uses that information to draw conclusions about the population as a whole. The populations used in statistical analysis can be anything from a group of water quality measurements in a river system to the heights of soldiers in the U.S. Army. The science behind the analysis is the same no matter where the data is drawn from. No matter what kind of data is being analyzed, the statistical process uses the same steps. Problem definition, data collection, data analysis, and reporting the final analysis. This process is designed to be rigorous and scientific, providing an impartial look at the data and an impartial analysis of the results. Welcome to the world of statistics. You are probably wondering, why should I learn statistics? Statistics helps us make better sense of the world and make better business decisions. For example, by understanding statistics, we are able to understand internet articles and reports, magazine articles, newspaper articles. Also, we are able to use the data provided to us in business memos, business research, technical journals and reports to make better business decisions. In business, statistics has several critical uses. We use statistics to summarize business data, draw conclusions from business data, make reliable forecasts about activities, and improve business processes. Today's good decisions are driven by data. In all aspects of our lives, and importantly in the business context, an amazing diversity of data is available for inspection and analytical insight. Business managers and professionals are increasingly required to justify decisions on the basis of data. They need statistical model-based decision support systems. Statistical skills enable them to intelligently collect, analyze and interpret data relevant to their decision making. Statistical concepts and statistical thinking enable them to solve problems in a diversity of contexts, add substance to decisions and reduce guesswork. In a competitive environment, business managers must design quality into products and into the processes of making the products. They must facilitate a process of never-ending improvement at all stages of manufacturing and service. This is a strategy that employs statistical methods, particularly statistically designed experiments and produces processes that divide high yield and products that seldom fail. Moreover, it facilitates development of robust products that are insensitive to changes in the environment and internal component variation. 
carefully planned statistical studies remove hindrances to high quality and productivity at every stage of production. It saves time and money. It is well recognized that quality must be engineered into products as early as possible in the design process. One must know how to use carefully planned cost-effective statistical experiments to improve, optimize and make robust products and processes. <clears throat> business statistics is a science assisting you to make business decisions under uncertainties based on some numerical and measurable scales. Decision-making processes must be based on data, not on personal opinion nor on belief. A course in appreciation of statistical thinking gives business professionals an edge. Professionals with strong quantitative skills are in demand. To get started in this course, it is important to learn the basic terminology. These include statistics and descriptive statistics. Statistics is the branch of mathematics that transforms data into useful information for decision makers. Descriptive statistics is the process of collecting, summarizing, presenting, and analyzing data. Inferential statistics uses data collected from a small group to draw conclusions about a larger group. Descriptive methods are used to create charts and tables to draw conclusions about business data. We collect data, like in a survey, present data in tables and charts, and characterize data by giving the sample mean. Inferential methods are used to make reliable forecasts about business activities to develop, quantify and improve accuracy of predictive models. For example, we estimate the population mean weight using the same mean weight, or we may test the claim that population mean weight is 180 pounds. Variables are characteristics of an item or individual and are what you analyze when you use a statistical method. For example, sales, expenses and net profile. When used in everyday speech, variables suggest that something changes or varies and you would expect sales, expenses and net profit to have different value from year to year. Data are the different values associated with the variable. Data values are meaningless unless their variables are operational definitions, universally accepted meanings that are clear to all associated with an analysis. A population consists of all the items or individuals about which you want to draw a conclusion. The population is the large group. All registered voters in Ohio is an example of a population. Sample is the portion of a population selected for analysis. The sample is the small group. Using the population of all registered voters in Ohio, you could create a sample of 500 registered voters to survey. Parameter is a numerical measure that describes a characteristic of a population. The average amount of money spent by all customers at a store this weekend is an example because this amount refers to the amount spent in the entire population. Statistic is a numerical measure that describes a characteristic of a sample. The average amount spent by 30 customers completing the customer satisfaction survey is an example of a statistic. Before we start looking at graphing, let's review some basic terminology in organizing data. Categorical or qualitative variables have values that can only be placed into categories such as yes and no. Examples include marital status, political party, eye color, defined categories. Numerical or quantitative variables have values that represent quantities. Discrete variables arise from a counting process. Examples are number of children or defects per hour. Continuous variables arise from a measuring process. Examples are weight or voltage. 
nominal scale classifies data into distinct categories in which no ranking is implied. For example, the response to who is your internet provider results in answers that are not ranked in value. They are all equal. Ordinal scale classifies data into distinct categories in which ranking is implied. For example, the results to what is your faculty rank could be lecturer, instructor, assistant professor, associate professor and professor, or what is your grade. Each answer has a value that is ranked higher or lower on a scale. Surveying and sampling. Establishing a business objective focuses data collection. Examples of business objectives can be a marketing research analyst that needs to assess the effectiveness of a new television advertisement, or a pharmaceutical manufacturer that needs to determine whether a new drug is more effective than those currently in use. Some more examples of business objectives. An operations manager wants to monitor a manufacturing process to find out whether the quality of the product being manufactured is conforming to company standards. Or an auditor wants to review the financial transactions of a company in order to determine whether the company is in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Let's look at sources of data. There are primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources, the data collector is the one using the data for analysis. Data from political survey, data collected from an experiment or observed data. Secondary sources, the person performing data analysis is not the data collector. Analyzing census data, examining data from print journals or data published on the internet. Here are five categories of sources of data. Data distributed by an organization or an individual, a designed experiment, a survey, an observational study, and data collected by ongoing business activities. These are examples of data distributed by organizations or individuals. Financial data on a company provided by investment services, industry or market data from market research firms and trade associations, and stock prices, weather conditions, and sports statistics in daily newspapers. Examples of data from a designed experiment are consumer testing of different versions of a product to help determine which product should be pursued further, material testing to determine which supplier's material should be used in a product, and market testing on alternative product promotions to determine which promotion to use more broadly. Some examples of survey data are political polls of registered voters during political campaigns, or people being surveyed to determine their satisfaction with a recent product or service experience. Examples of data collected from observational studies can be market researchers utilizing focus groups to elicit unstructured responses to open-ended questions, or measuring the time it takes for customers to be served in a fast food establishment, or measuring the volume of traffic through an intersection to determine if some form of advertising at the intersection is justified. Some examples of data collected from ongoing business activities can be a bank studies years of financial transactions to help them identify patterns of fraud, or an economist utilize data on searches done via Google to help forecast future economic conditions, and marketing companies use tracking data to evaluate the effectiveness of a website. Data cleaning is often a necessary activity when collecting data. You will often find irregularities in the data such as typographical or data entry errors, values that are impossible or undefined, missing values or outliers. When found, these irregularities should be reviewed. Many statistical software packages will handle irregularities in an automated fashion. Excel does not. Why sample? 
selecting a sample is less time consuming than selecting every item in the population census. An analysis of sample is less cumbersome and more practical than an analysis of the entire population. A sampling process begins with a sampling frame. The sampling frame is a listing of items that make up the population. Frames are data sources such as population lists, directories or maps. Inaccurate or biased results can result if a frame excludes certain portions of the population. Using different frames to generate data can lead to dissimilar conclusions. Types of samples. In convenience sampling, items are selected based only on the fact that they are easy, inexpensive or convenient to sample. In a judgment sample, you get the opinions of pre-selected experts in the subject matter. In a simple random, every individual or item from the frame has an equal chance of being selected. Other types of samples are systematic sample, where you decide on sample size, divide into a set number of groups and randomly select one individual from each group. Or a stratified sample, where you divide population into two or more subgroups called strata, according to some common characteristic. And cluster sample, where population is divided into several clusters, each representative of the population. Exit polls after elections. Types of survey error. 1. Coverage error or selection bias. This exists if some groups are excluded from the frame and have no chance of being selected. If the frame is inadequate because certain groups of items in the population were not properly included, any random sample selected will provide only an estimate of the characteristics of the frame, not the actual population. 2. Non-response error or bias. People who do not respond may be different from those who do respond. You should make several attempts to convince individuals that may typically not complete the survey to complete it. Mode of response should be considered. 3. Sampling error. Variation from sample to sample will always exist. Chance indicates some group may always be left out. Example, when you read polls, you are told the margin of error is more or less 4 percentage point of the actual value. You can reduce sampling error by using larger sample sizes, although doing so increases the cost of doing the survey. 3. Sampling error. Variation from sample to sample will always exist. Chance indicates some group may always be left out. For example, when you read polls, you are told the margin of error is more or less 4 percentage points of the actual value. You can reduce sampling error by using larger sample sizes, although doing so increases the cost of doing the survey. 4. Measurement error. Due to weaknesses in question design, respondent error and interviewer's effects on the respondent, Hawthorne effect, occurs when the interviewee feels compelled to please the interviewer. Ethical issues. Coverage error can result in selection bias and becomes an ethical issue if particular groups are purposely excluded from the frame so that the survey results are more favorable to the survey sponsor. Non-response error can lead to non-response bias and becomes an ethical issue if the sponsor knowingly designs the survey so that particular groups or individuals are less likely than others to respond. Sampling error becomes an ethical issue if the findings are purposely presented without reference to the sample size and margin of error so that the sponsor can promote a viewpoint that might otherwise be truly insignificant. Measurement error becomes an ethical issue if the survey sponsors chooses leading questions that guide the responses in a particular direction, an interviewer through mannerism and tone purposely creates the Hawthorne effect, or a respondent willfully provides false information. Getting started with Excel Data Analysis Toolpack. Excel provides more advanced statistical and engineering analysis tools that are not installed by default. 
If you're interested in using Excel for statistical analysis, you should install the Analysis Toolpack for Excel. To confirm whether you already have the Analysis Toolpack installed, open the Data tab on the Excel ribbon. If the Analysis Toolpack is installed, you should see a Data Analysis button on the ribbon, like the one shown here. If the Analysis Toolpack is not installed, go to the File tab and select Options in the left column. In the Excel Options window, select the Add Ins category on the left. Near the bottom of this window, you see Excel Add-ins already selected in a drop-down menu labeled Manage. Click the Go button next to this drop-down. The Add-ins dialog will open. Here you can select the checkbox next to Analysis Toolpack and any other add-ins you want to install. Click OK. The Data Analysis button, as shown in the first screenshot, should now be available in the Excel ribbon under the Data tab. This button will open the Data Analysis dialog, which offers access to a variety of analysis tools. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Justin Bate here, and um, in this module we're going to talk about describing data using descriptive statistics. So as we learned in, with visualizing data, charts and graphs are useful to represent data in a user-friendly format. But there are times when it's more important to summarize data numerically. A quality numerical data summary has meaning even to individuals with no previous experience with the data being presented. You don't have to be a scientist or a doctor to understand that the average cholesterol for a given male population is 220 while the cholesterol level for women in the same population might be 190. In order to understand the power of numerical data summary, it's important to understand the difference between the median and the mean. Mean. The mean is the average of all observations, while the median is the point at which half the numbers are larger and half are smaller. The mode is another important numerical data representation. It's the observation that occurs most frequently. The mean, median, mode are important, but so is the variance. The term variance is used to measure how widely or narrowly spread out a group of numbers is. For instance, a set of numbers in which all the values are seven has zero variance. These terms are used to summarize a set of numbers and help the observer make sense of results. Whether the data is being represented in a list of baseball statistics, salary data for a Fortune 500 company, or the cholesterol levels of heart patients, the summarization techniques are the same. Hello everyone, and welcome to the module about descriptive statistics. When you have a new set of data, there are some general questions you can ask about the data to learn a bit more. This can be questions about what variables are included or what information we are getting. It can be about what the format of the variables is or the type of variables or if it's sample or population data. There may be things you would like to know after looking at the data. For instance, how many males or females there are, what the average age is, how many undergraduate or graduate students, what the average SAT score is or who reads the newspaper more frequently, men or women. Some of these questions may already be answered by looking at the table, but for some of the other ones, you might have to do some calculations by obtaining a set of descriptive statistics. These statistics are a collection of measurements of two things, location and variability. Location tells you the central value of your variables, Variability refers to the spread of the data from the center value and statistics you can see as the study of what causes such variability. Let's move to Excel. So you use the descriptive statistics data file. Then you click on data, then data analysis, descriptive statistics, and for input range you select all data. And this is what the screen should look like. 
since we include the labels in the first row, you have to make sure to check that box. For the output option, which is the place where Excel will enter the results, you select O1, or you can select a new worksheet or even a new workbook. Then you check summary statistics, and then we press OK. The result will look like this. Now we're going to select all the descriptive statistic cells and go to Format Cells so we can change all the numbers to have only one decimal point. When you get the Format Cells window, this is what you select. If you now click OK, all the numbers should have one decimal. If we look at the overview, what can we then see from the data? Well, the average student in this sample is 25.2 years old. They have a SAT score of 1848.9. They have a grade of 80.4. They are 66.4 inches tall and they read the newspaper 4.9 times a week. And we notice by looking at the mean value on each variable. And the mean is the sum of the observations divided by the total number of observations and the most common indicator of central tendency of a variable. If you look at the last two rows, sum and count, you can estimate the mean dividing sum by count. You can also calculate the mean by using the function shown here. And please note that all functions start with the equal sign. If you want to calculate the sum of all the values in a range in Excel, you will use the function equals sum. If you would like to calculate this for the ages of all the students, you would use equals average J2 to J31. If you use the count function in Excel, it will count all the cells that contain values. Min refers to the lowest value in an array of values. And, of course, max will refer to the largest value in an array of values. The standard error, or SE, indicates how close the sample mean is from the true population mean. The average age of 25.2 years is just an estimate of this sample of students, but it can vary if you had used a different set of students. The standard error is calculated by dividing the standard deviation of the population by the square root of the total number of observations. You can use the standard error to roughly define a range of certainty for the mean. For the lower, we calculate this as the mean minus the standard error times the value in Z. So that would be 25.2 minus 1.3 times 2, which equals 22.7. For the upper, you take the mean plus the standard error times the value in Z, and that would be 25.2 plus 1.3 times 2, which equals 27.7. What we can conclude from this overview is that we are 68% certain that the average age is between 23.9 and 26.5 years old, that we are 95% certain that the average age is between 22.7 and 27.7 years old, and that we are 99% certain that the average age is between 21.4 and 29.0 years old. And note that the more certainty, the wider the gap. Now let's look at the median. This is another measure of central tendency, which is the number in the middle. And to get to the median, you have to order the data first from lowest to highest. If you have an odd number of cases, the median is this single value. But if you have an even number of cases, the median is the average of the two numbers in the middle. Mode refers to the number that's most common in the data. So for age, this would be 19 years old. In the SAT scores, the mode is hashtag NA, and this means that all the values are unique. The range is a measure of dispersion. That means that it's simply the difference between the largest and the smallest value. The sample variance measures the dispersion of the data from the mean. 
and it is the simple mean of the square distance from the mean. The sample variance equals the sum of the square of x mean of x divided by the number of observation minus 1. And you will see that the higher the variance, the more dispersion from the mean. The standard deviation is the squared root of the variance, and it indicates how close the data is to the mean. Now, if we assume a normal distribution, we can say that 68% of the values are within one standard deviation from the mean, 95% are within two standard deviation, and 99% are within three standard deviation. With skewness, we measure the asymmetry of the data. So when in an otherwise normal curve, one of the tails is longer than the other one. It is also used to test for normality in the data by dividing it by the standard error. If the skewness is positive, there is more data on the left side of the curve. And if there is a negative value, this indicates that the mass of the data is concentrated on the right of the curve. And a normal distribution has a skew of zero. With kurtosis, you measure the peak of the distribution, and it's also an indicator of normality. If you have a positive kurtosis, this indicates too few cases in the tails or a tall distribution, and a negative kurtosis indicates too many cases in the tails or a flat distribution. A normal distribution has a kurtosis of zero. The purpose of this exercise is to teach you how to get descriptive statistics using the data analysis tool pack in Excel, as well as some of the functions embedded within Excel. You can see here that I've entered the data from company S into Excel. Recall from the problem in the textbook that the company is interested in looking at the processing time for tax returns. In order to get our descriptive statistics, we must first select the data we would like Excel to use. We would like to look at the processing time variable. We do not need to get descriptive statistics on the return ID because it is not necessary to know the mean, median, mode, and so forth for the return ID. What we're really interested in are the descriptive statistics for the processing time. Once we have our data highlighted, we can go up to the data ribbon and over to the Data Analysis Tool Pack button. We will then want to select Descriptive Statistics and click OK. We need to then tell Excel exactly what data we want used and remind it that we have a label in the first row. So we do not need Excel to use the word processing time at the top. That's simply a label for our column. So by checking this box, Excel knows to exclude that row and column B1 when running the descriptive statistics. We have this set up to pop out a table in a new worksheet ply, and we will label it descriptive statistics so that we can easily locate it once it is created. We also want to check the box for summary statistics. Once we have everything situated, we can click OK. And a new tab will open up that is called Descriptive Statistics, just as we, as we had named it. And we can see that we need to resize a little bit so that we can see all the information. Excel has produced for us a number of important and useful descriptive statistics. We can see that our average processing time is 43.89 or 44. We can also get other statistics by using some of the formulas outlined in the textbook, like the quartiles. To get our quartiles range and interquartile range, we need to go back to the sheet that contains our data. For our first quartile, we simply enter the formula for the quartile. and let Excel know the range of the data we would like to use, which are all of our data points for processing time, and a number one to signify that we want the first quartile. And we can see that our first quartile value is 18.5. To get the third quartile, we use the same formula and the same data array 
but we end with the number 3 to indicate that we would like the third quartile. So we know that our third quartile is 61.5. To get our range, we need to know our minimum and maximum values. To get our minimum value, we use the min formula and select the data we'd like to use. To find our maximum, we use the max formula. To get our range, we simply take the maximum which is located in column E, row 7, and subtract from it the minimum in column E, row 6. So our range is 76. Now to get our interquartile range, we simply take quartile 3, which is located in column E, row 5, minus quartile 1, located in column E, row 4. So our interquartile range is 43. And that's how you can use the formulas in Excel to get additional information. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Bate. Hope you're doing well. In this uh, module we are going to cover visualizing data. So presenting data visually can make it a lot easier to understand and absorb it. It's one thing to you know, present and read a row of figures on a page, but quite another to see those figures presented in a user-friendly chart. We can sit in a conference room and post statistics up on a um, chalkboard or a whiteboard or a projector, and not everybody is going to understand what we're talking about. However, by putting up a pie chart or a bar chart, everybody can kind of get the gist of what's happening. So that data visualization process aims to make sense of the raw data, presenting it in a manner that it's easy to understand even for non-experts. Pie charts and bar charts are among the most commonly used data visualization techniques. They can be easily created using common spreadsheet programs such as Microsoft Excel. Numerical data can be presented in histograms while categorical data can be visualized using frequency tables and charts. Cumulative frequencies count the number of data points up to a given value and are then used to find the mean, <coughs> to find the median, quartile, and percentiles in a group of data. Relative frequency, on the other hand, is used to represent how often something happens relative to some total. For example, the relative frequency may be used to show that a given sales team won 10 of its last 13 contracts, while the cumulative frequency will, be, will show the median number of contracts won across the entire year. All, in, all said, visualizing data is an important skill and the ability is important whether you're running a business or teaching a seminar. You can get a sense of the importance of data by looking at numbers on a spreadsheet but a well-chosen visual representation of data can be much more useful. Hi everyone, and welcome to Visualizing Data. In business, you are sometimes asked to give presentations where you present the results of specific analysis or present data to stakeholders. Very often you will be given these data in a raw form. This is why it's important to know how to organize the data so that you can also choose the appropriate visual form for a presentation. You might wonder why you should be concerned about visualizing data. In the topics in this course, you will get accustomed to the terminology of statistics. However, when you're presenting data in a business setting, not all persons in the room will have the same level of knowledge. And most will be able to look at a chart, a graph, or some type of visual and have an aha moment when they see the bigger picture. Okay, so what will we be looking at in this module? We will look at creating the following things in Excel. Frequency distribution, histogram, and time series graph. Let's start with the frequency distribution and histogram. So 
What is a histogram? Well, it's a bar chart for group numerical data in which you use vertical bars to represent frequencies or percentages in each group. Moving to frequency distribution, this summarizes numerical values by tallying them into a set of numerically ordered classes. And to create a useful frequency distribution, you must think about how many classes are appropriate for your data and also determine a suitable width for each class interval. Okay, let's dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, in general, you should have at least five classes and no more than 15. And to determine the class interval width, we'll use the following formula. It's the higher value minus the lowest value divided by the number of classes. Okay, time for some action. The data below shows the sales of 39 US national parks in column A and we've decided to use six classes and the class boundaries are provided as well. So I want you to construct a frequency distribution and a histogram for the data using six classes. The first step is to put all the sales data into column A in Excel. The next step is to put the class upper boundaries for the first seven classes in cells B2 until B8. You then go to the data tab and in the analysis group, you click on data analysis. The next step is to select histogram and then you click OK. Then you select the input range and then select the bin range. Excel will add one class. Now we move on to select the output range and you can use any unused cell in the worksheet. The next step will be to select the chart output and you can look in the lower left corner. Then click OK. Then we edit the chart title and axis labels. And to eliminate the spaces between the bars, you can right click on one of the histogram bars and select Format Data Series. And then you move up the gap width slider all the way to the left. And this is what the result should look like. Let's move on to the time series graph. This plots the values of a numerical variable on the y-axis and plots the time period associated with each numerical value on the x-axis. A time series plot can help explore trends in data that occur over time. We are now going to construct a time series graph for the sales data we received for a five-year period. We start with putting in the following data into column A. The sales data is going to be put into column B. Then you will highlight the data in both columns and then you click insert and the scatter and then you choose scatter with straight lines and markers. And this is what the end result should look like. Now, if a business person looks at this graph, they will interpret it as having strong sales as we approach 2003, but there is a visible dip in sales during 2004 and 2005 and a manager would like to know why this happens and how they can fix it. We finished this module with the bar chart and the pie chart. The bar chart compares different categories by using individual bars to represent the tallies for each category. And the pie chart uses parts of a circle to represent the tallies of each category. Thank you for your attention. I hope this was an educational module and you learned something about visualizing data. The purpose of these exercises is to introduce you to the charting functions in Excel. The first example in the textbook introduces us to a scenario where we have the percentage of the population living in poverty and the violent crime rate per 100,000 people in 2009 in the six New England states. So we're going to look at both a bar chart and a pie chart in order to decide which display is better for our data. The first thing you'll need to do is enter the data into Excel so that you can use the values from the textbook to create the charts that we're going to show you today. As you can see here, I have already entered the data from the textbook. You will need to enter in a column for the states, the poverty rate, and the crime rate. Once you have all of the data entered into Excel, you can begin to insert the different types of charts. To insert a chart, 
you must first select the data you want included in that chart. We're going to select the state and poverty columns because we're first going to look at a chart of poverty by state. To insert a chart, you click on the insert ribbon at the top of the screen and go to the section where the charts are outlined. As the textbook states, we could click recommended chart and let Excel decide which chart is best for our data, or we can explore different options on our own. The first chart we are going to explore is a pie chart. So we navigate to the pie chart button and click on it. We then have a couple of options to choose from, and as we move our cursor over each option, we can see that an example is displayed for us below. We're going to choose the 3D pie chart. Once we select it, it will appear in our workbook. As we hover our cursor over different slices of the pie chart, we see a little box pop up that tells us the rate and which state we're hovering over. There's also a key at the bottom of the chart that shows us which state goes with which color in the pie chart. This is clearly not the best way to display these data, so now we're going to explore a better option, and that's a column bar chart. So I'm going to select this chart and delete it. I'm going to leave these sections of the data highlighted because we still want to make a chart that covers poverty for each state, but this time we're going to go up to insert and select the column bar chart. Just like with a pie chart, we have a couple different options to choose from, but in following the textbook example, we're going to choose the 3D column chart. So we see our chart produced below in the workbook. You can easily reposition and resize the chart by using the mouse. You can also choose to get rid of certain elements like the title just by highlighting them and clicking delete. You can see that actually makes the chart area a little bit bigger and easier to read. We can also choose different styles or formats for our chart to make it more readable or more appealing. To do that, we simply click on the chart area to highlight it. And when we do that, a new set of menus opens in Excel. See chart tools here in green appears when we have the chart below highlighted. When we click outside of the chart back into the workbook, we no longer can see those chart menus. In order to access the chart menus, we need to have the chart highlighted. So we'll click on the chart and go up to design and we can choose from a number of different formats for our chart. As we scroll along the different styles, we can see our chart below and what it will look like in those different styles. And following the textbook, we'll select style number three. Once we click it, the change becomes permanent, and we now have a nicely formatted bar chart for our data. If we would like to now create a chart for crime, we can do that by selecting the appropriate data. So we can move this chart over that we just created, and now we must select the state column and the crime column. There are a couple of ways to do this. It's not as easy as selecting the state and poverty column because those are actually right next to each other. State and crime are not, so we can either highlight the state column, and then while holding the control key on the keyboard, select the crime column, or we can simply copy and paste our information below, which will allow us to create a new table where the columns we need are right next to each other. So we can now select our columns of interest and create another chart. I'm going to follow the same procedures as we did for poverty. And now that we've formatted it the same way, we can move them around and resize them so that they both fit on the same page. Now we have created column bar charts for both poverty and crime. Now we are going to explore Excel's histogram tools using the fluoride added to the water example from the textbook. Remember, you will need to have the analysis tool pack enabled in Excel to be able to do this exercise.
The steps for adding this tool pack were outlined in Chapter 1. You can see whether you have the tool pack enabled by going to the Data ribbon and ensuring that Data Analysis shows up at the very end like it does here. The example in the book states that many communities add fluoride to water to prevent tooth decay. In a 25-day period, these levels of fluoride were measured, and you see those values entered in here into Excel. So in order to complete this exercise on your own, you will need to enter the values from the textbook for this example into Excel in a single column like we've done here. We will now use the analysis tool pack to create a histogram for these data. We will need to go to the Data Analysis button, which again is under the Data ribbon. When we click on it, it pops up a dialog box with many different options to choose from. We will be choosing Histogram for this exercise. When we click OK, we see a new dialog box pop up with all the options for Histogram. We need to tell Excel the input range for our data. To do that, we must have our cursor in the box for input range. We can then either enter it in manually or use our cursor to select the data. To use your cursor to select the data, make sure that it is enabled in the box. You can then go into the data field, click on the first cell, and drag down till you encapsulate all of the values you want represented. You can see that it then auto fills in our input range. Excel allows you to choose the bin range that you would like to use, or you have the option to leave it blank and let Excel choose what it feels is the most appropriate decision for bin range. We do not have our column headed by a label, so we do not need to check the labels box. We also want to make sure that our histogram comes up on a new worksheet, and if we want we can title that worksheet so it's easy to find. I'm simply going to title this histogram. We also want to make sure we click the box Chart Output, because that is how we'll actually get our histogram chart. If we do not check this box, we will only get a frequency table and no chart. Once we've selected all the options we need in this dialog box, we can click OK. Once we do that, we are automatically navigated to our new sheet, which you can see down here we've labeled Histogram. We can easily go back to our data sheet by clicking Sheet 2, which is where those data are entered. But in that histogram sheet that was created, we see a frequency table with all of our data organized by frequency, as well as the histogram that we've asked Excel to create. We are now able to customize our chart by resizing it, removing different aspects of it to make it bigger, and so forth. As we explained, we allowed Excel to auto-create the bin width for our histogram. Typically, histograms have bins that are connected in order to represent the fact that the data are on an interval scale rather than categorical, with the bin centered over the midpoint of the range. Excel does histograms differently by creating separated bins labeled by the upper limit of the range. Keep this distinction in mind when interpreting histograms made in Excel. Now we will show you how to create another histogram for the fluoride data that has four bins created manually. The first thing we need to do is determine the boundaries of the bins so that we can determine the parameters necessary to create exactly four bins. We can do this by utilizing Excel's min and max functions. We're going to go back to the sheet where our data are entered and locate the minimum and maximum values. With a data set this small, containing only 25 values, we could easily eyeball these data and figure out the minimum and maximum value. But with data sets that are much larger than this, that is not always possible. So we can use functions in Excel to pinpoint the minimum and maximum values without having to actually look through all of the data and find them ourselves. To find the minimum, we enter the following formula. We must select the range 
that we'd like Excel to check for the minimum. So we can see here that the minimum value is 72. And again, we could have easily looked through these 25 values and found that the minimum value was 72, but if our data set were much larger, we would not want to do that. We can find the maximum value with a similar formula. And find easily that the maximum value is 105. We can now use the minimum and maximum values to define our bins. The first thing we need to do is find the bin width for having four bins. To do that, we simply take the maximum minus the minimum and divide by four, which is the number of bins we would like. We arrive at a bin width of 8.25. We must now enter into an Excel a column for our boundaries. We will use this bin width and the minimum value to define our boundaries. Our first boundary will equal the minimum plus our bin width, which is 8.25. Our second boundary will be our minimum plus two times our width. Our next boundary will again be our minimum, but this time plus two times our bin width. And our third boundary will equal our minimum plus three times our bin width. Now we can go back to our data analysis button and create a histogram using our manually defined boundaries. This time we'll want to enter in a bin range. For the bin range, we need to include the boundaries that we've created. To do that, we simply activate the bin range box by making sure our cursor shows up. Then we can go into the data field and select our three boundaries. We now want to make a new title for our worksheet so that it does not overwrite the old one. We'll simply call this histogram 2. Again, we want to ensure that the chart output box is selected so that we get our histogram. When we click OK, a new sheet will open up that shows our frequency table with our manually defined bins. We are then free to edit it as we have done with previous charts. Manually creating different bins is a challenging task that requires a lot of practice. It's also something that is frequently done so it's helpful to get further practice by going through another example. To do the next example, go to the betterbusinessdecisions.org website and download the MLB Player Salaries dataset. This is an Excel file that you will need to do the next exercise. Here I have opened the MLB Player Salaries Excel file, which we will use to do the next exercise. You can see that we have salary information for baseball players who played in the year 1988 all the way up to the year 2011. So if we scroll all the way down, we can see that we have quite a lot of data. We have 19,544 rows of data but we actually only have 19,543 data points. This is because our first row is filled with labels for our columns. So although we have 19,544 rows, we only have 19,543 data points. We are going to use these data to walk through another example of manually creating bins for a histogram. Just like before, 
the first thing we'll need to do is identify the minimum and maximum values. Remember before when we had a data set of 25 values, it was easy enough to eyeball the data and pinpoint the minimum and maximum values. With 19,544 data points, this task is not as easy. So our minimum and maximum functions in Excel that we've already learned are going to come in handy. Our first step here will be to find the minimum and the maximum values using the min and max formulas in Excel. So I would like for Excel to sift through column C, which contains all of our salary amounts. Now we don't need column C row 1 because that includes the label. The first data point we need is in column C row 2. And I want to search all the way through, which is the colon sign, to the end, which we know is column C row 19,544. Once I have that entered into the formula bar, I can click enter and see that our minimum salary value from all those data points is 62,500. Now we must find the maximum value using the same procedure but with the max formula. And we can see that our maximum salary is 33 million. Now that we have our minimum and maximum value, we need to find our bin width so that we can identify our boundaries. Let's remind ourselves that we want to find 10 bins. And remember, to get our bin width, we simply calculate our maximum value, which is located in column H, row 2, minus our minimum value in column H, row 1, and divide by the number of bins. Now that we have our bin width, we can assign our boundaries. Our first boundary is going to be equal to our minimum value plus our bin width, which is located in H4. Our second boundary is going to be equal to our minimum plus two times our bin width. Our next boundary is equal to our minimum plus three times our bin width. So we must enter this formula in nine times to arrive at nine different boundaries, which will give us our ten bin widths. Now that we have our nine boundaries entered into Excel, we can create our histogram. Remember that to do this, you go to the data ribbon and select data analysis. You can see that Excel will save our information from past charts that we've created. So we do want to reset and enter the values for this Excel sheet. The input range is going to be the salary values. So we want column C starting at row 2, all the way down through column C, 19,544. Our bin range is going to be the boundaries that we've created, and we can use the cursor to select those because there aren't very many. The format Excel uses to autofill in our bin ranges looks a little bit different than we do it ourselves, but we're still going to get the exact information that we need. We're going to call this tab histogram 3, and we're going to ensure that chart output is checked, and then click OK. We now have a tab that opens up with our histogram for the salary information. We now have a histogram for the salary data that uses the bin widths we've created. The examples we have just gone through all utilized continuous numerical data. 
We are now going to walk through an example that demonstrates how to use the charting tools for categorical variables. The next example will utilize the Student Survey Excel file from the BetterBusinessDecisions.org website. Here we have open the Student Survey Excel file, which we are going to use for the next part of the exercise. We are going to utilize the race variable to demonstrate how to create a table to display categorical information. Now with a small amount of data like this, we could easily go through our race variable and identify the categories and the frequency for each group. And we could create a table manually by having a column that defines the category. We see that we have people who identified as white, black, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, or other. We can also go through and easily count the frequency for each category. We can go through and see that 15 people identified as white, 3 is black, 2 is Hispanic, 1 is Pacific Islander, and 2 is other. And that's a quick and easy way to create a frequency table to display categorical information. But if our data set was much larger than this, we would not want to go through and identify all of the categories ourselves, nor would we want to sum up the number of participants in each category by ourselves. So luckily there are features in Excel that will do this for us. This feature is called a pivot table. We can find the pivot table by navigating to the insert ribbon. We can see that it's the first option listed here. When we click on it, a dialog box opens that asks us to select a table or the range of the data we would like to be selected. I'm going to select all of the data so that we have all of it available in the next phase of creating the pivot table. One thing we want to be careful to do is select New Worksheet so that our table opens in a new sheet away from this original data file. When we click OK, Excel will automatically navigate us there, where we see a potential empty frequency table and all of our variables for our data set. We can now build a custom pivot table. We want to build one for race, so we'll take our race variable and drag it over to the drop row fields here box. You can see that Excel automatically finds all of the categories in our data and lists them out here for us. We now want to identify the value fields. We again take the race variable and drag it over into this box. Now Excel has automatically created a table much like we did earlier by hand, but automatically. So again, this would be much more useful if we had a large data set where we did not want to take the time to sift through all of the different categories and number of participants who identified as each category. We can now use the tools in Excel to make changes to our pivot table. Say for example, we wanted to eliminate categories that didn't have any responses or were indicators of missing data. We can see that we have a row listed as blank which just means that that row or that field was left blank in the original data. If we navigate back to the original data by going to the bottom of the Excel sheet, we can see that there was one respondent who did not indicate their race. So Excel took this blank cell as a category and included it in our table. We can easily eliminate that row by clicking the down arrow, which is located next to our category label of race, and unselecting the box for blank. Right now, the box Select All is checked, so all categories are being represented. But if we uncheck the box for blank and click OK, we can see that Excel will remove that row for us. We can also make changes to the way the data are displayed. Right now, what's being displayed is a total frequency count in the column labeled Total. But if we wanted, we could change this to be a percentage. To do that, we double click on count of race 
navigate to the Show Values As tab, and right now no calculation is being displayed. It's just simply the frequency count. But we can easily change that to be a percentage of the grand total. So when we click OK, you can see that the frequency count is changed into a percentage. And we can easily change that back by going back to that dialog box and returning it to no calculation. Now that we have a frequency table of our data, we can use it to generate a column bar chart. We simply select the data we'd like to use and follow our steps from earlier. We go to the Insert Ribbon, click the Column Bar Chart button, and we'll do a 3D column chart like we've done previously. Just like before, we are able to now resize and eliminate any items we wish to exclude. Now we have a column bar chart of our race data. And that is how you can use the tools in Excel to create frequency tables and bar charts for categorical variables.